We invite you to join in singing our prelude, the song before Mass, which is on the board, 623, the cry of the poor, 623. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate the 25th Sunday in Ordinary Time. In today's Gospel, Jesus reminds us that our highest loyalty, obedience, and devotion must be given to God before any other person, institution, cause, or worldly goods such as money. We are meant to use money and the other things of this world for God's glory and for the good of others, and not just for our own comfort or advantage. Please remember to silence your cell phones so that we can worship God without distraction. Thank you. The celebrant for this Mass is Father Isaiah Mary, and the preacher is Brother Xavier Marie. Let us begin our Mass by singing as found on the board, number 314. All are welcome. 314.
Jesus into our heart of hearts. Uh, after communion, our residency brother, uh, our intern brother, Brother Xavier Marie, will be uh, offering a theological reflection after the end of communion about Our Lady of Sorrow. I'm going to celebrate these mysteries of our faith that is quiet our hearts and minds, grateful always as we are for God's love and compassion. I confess. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins and bring us to life everlasting.
Let us pray. O God, who founded all the commands of your sacred law upon love of you and of our neighbor, grant that by keeping your precepts we may merit to attain eternal life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. Hear this, you who trample upon the needy and destroy the poor of the land. When will the new moon be over, you ask, that we may sell our grain, and the Sabbath, that we may display the wheat. We will diminish the ephah, add to the shekel, and fix our scales for cheating. We will buy the lowly for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. Even the refuse of the wheat we will sell. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, never will I forget a thing they have done. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, first of all, I ask 
that supplications, prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be offered for everyone, for kings and for all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and tranquil life in all devotion and dignity. This is good and pleasing to God our Savior, who wills everyone to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as ransom for all. This was the testimony at the proper time. For this, I was appointed preacher and apostle. I'm speaking the truth. I am not lying, teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. It is my wish then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. The word of the Lord. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, a rich man had a steward who was reported to him for squandering his property. He summoned him and said, what is this I hear about you? Prepare full account of your stewardship because you can no longer be my steward. The steward said to himself, what shall I do? Now that my master is taking the position of steward away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I shall, what I shall do so that when I am removed from the stewardship, they may welcome me into their homes. He called in his master's debtors one by one. To the first he said, how much do you owe my master? He replied, 100 measures of olive oil. He said to him, here's your promissory note. Sit down and quickly write one for 50. Then to another, the steward said, and you, how much do you owe? He replied, 100 cores of wheat. The steward said to him, here's your promissory note. Write one for 80. And the master commended that dishonest steward for acting prudently. For the children of this world are more prudent in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. I tell you, make friends for yourselves with dishonest wealth, so that when it fails, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. 
The person who is trustworthy in very small matters is also trustworthy of great ones. And the person who is dishonest in very small matters is also dishonest in great ones. If, therefore, you are not trustworthy with dishonest wealth, you who, who will trust you with true wealth? If you are not trustworthy in what belongs to another, who will give you what is yours? No servant can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or, devote, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. The Gospel of the Lord. So what does it mean, what does it mean to be a steward? Our parable today, of course, is the nickname, the parable of the the dishonest steward. So we, we encounter in a very real way what a steward is not. So what is a steward and what does it mean for us today? A steward basically is a person that takes care of something that ultimately does not belong to him, right? An overseer of a large estate. We can think of Downton Abbey in this way. This kind of overseer manages the property, the employees, the equipment, that kind of thing. He is overseeing a property for the sake of someone else. So eventually, ultimately, the overseer is eventually seeing a property that does not belong to him, right? And most of us here, many of us are stewards of the many things that we have in our display cabinets, atop our pianos, and maybe in a vault in a bank. Many of the things that we protect will be passed on. Whether it be a family heirloom of some sort of prized possession, the things that we own eventually are to be passed on to the next generation. But if we think about this more deeply, if we take a cold, hard, uncomfortable look, what truly do we actually own? What really belongs to us? What do we have that we can actually take in the life to come? And a short, cold, stoic answer is nothing. The old saying still goes, he who dies with the most toys still dies. The blankets that cover us will eventually cover another the health in which we enjoy today will eventually fade away. The place in which we reside will eventually house another. Even the faith that we practice, something that we take so seriously, like the faith that we share today, this eventually is handed on down to our children and our children's children. So dear friends, if we take a cold, hard, uncomfortable look, what do we actually own? The answer is nothing. Even our faith, as I said, something that we take very seriously, the reason why we are here on this Sunday morning, even our faith does not belong to us. So in short, we are stewards. We are stewards of the faith in which we hold true. We are those good stewards, taking deep care of what we hold dearest within our heart of hearts, this faith, this friendship we have with Christ. We are stewards of the faith that Christ has passed down to us. And why? What are we to do with this faith that has been handed on to us? This 2,000-year-old tradition that has been forming and informing the modern world in a myriad of ways, ways that our world is still to understand. What is the purpose of our stewardship? Our purpose is to hold this faith firmly within our hands, allowing this faith to shape us, to cure us, indeed to destroy us and rebuild us in order to make us, what? The greatest version of ourselves. We are to stand up for people who we see in our first reading, those who are scamming the poor, looking only at their social media accounts and their bank accounts. We are the stewards of those immortal virtues of faith, hope, and charity, seeking always justice for ourselves and for the world around us seeking always first the face of our God. We are stewards of a faith that eventually does not belong to us, and we nourish this faith, teach this faith, protect this faith, 
in order to make ourselves and the next generation the best versions that we and they can possibly be. We have been handed down our faith in order to be taken up to heaven and hopefully to bring our loved ones too. We have been handed down our faith in order to bring others to God. We've been handed down our faith in order to hand it on to others so that they may encounter God, the God in whom we encounter and love. We are stewards of the friendship that Jesus has offered us. And this is what we hand down to the next generation. In just a moment, dear friends, we are to be handed down the greatest gift that God can possibly offer. The greatest gift. The gift of God's very self handed on to us freely and completely and fully in order to heal us and to make us whole. So as we are handed down this beautiful gift, let us not squander this gift at the altar, but rather let us rely on this gift and allow this gift to transform us and to heal us so that truly we can be that great gift of compassion and healing to all we encounter this day. Knowing of the great faith that has been handed on to us, we now recite the great faith that's been given in our heart of hearts as we proclaim, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. He came down to heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate to the to man, and became man. For our sake he was crucified on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess in baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the light of the world to come. Amen. We now come before our God who lifts up the poor and humbles the exalted, and we bring to him our needs this day. That like the steward in today's gospel, we might be resourceful in giving the best of our energy strength, and time in serving God and others, we pray to the Lord. For the ongoing spiritual renewal of St. Dominic Parish, that we might seek a deeper relationship with Jesus more than earthly wealth, possessions, or success, we pray to the Lord. That victims of dishonesty and injustice may be protected by those in authority and find their dignity restored and that perpetrators may be converted to God's ways. We pray to the Lord. That those who serve in our parishes, school and religious education program may be blessed with wisdom and knowledge and find joy in being examples and teachers of faith. We pray to the Lord. 
For those who continue to struggle with natural calamities, violence, and war, may they receive God's help through their governments and through the kindness of their local communities. We pray to the Lord. For the repose of the soul of Bing Ariola, whom we remember in a special way at this Mass, we pray to the Lord. For the intentions written in our book of prayer and for all the intentions we hold in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Lord and in a special way, we pray for Father Roberto, Father Peter, and our parish community at this time of transition. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. So we pray together. Hail Receive with favor, O Lord, we pray the offerings of your people, that what they profess with devotion and faith may be theirs through these heavenly mysteries, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift up Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and eternal God. For you so loved the world that in your mercy you sent us the Redeemer to live like us in all things but sin, so that you might love in us what you loved in your Son, by, his, by whose obedience we have been restored to the gifts of yours, 
that by sinning we had lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks. As an exaltation, we acclaim. Graciously to the prayers of this family, whom we have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world, to our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you after passing from this life. Give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor and 
peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Him it takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Together we pray or act the spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things. And I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there. And unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you.
Let us pray. Graciously raise up, O Lord, those who are new with this sacrament, that we may come to possess your redemption, both in mystery and in the manner of our life. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated. I invite Brother Xavier Reed to the more for his theological reflection. The church traditionally dedicates every month to a sacred mystery. And September is dedicated to Our Lady of Sorrows, as many of you may know. Since I will be preaching to you only once a month on one of the Sundays, I thought it fitting to share with you something that you can reflect on throughout the month. Today and yesterday morning was the prelude, and also I will expound on this topic for the next two Saturdays. That will be the sequel of what I'm talking about today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many, and to be a sign that will be contradicted, and thy own soul a sword shall pierce, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Thy own soul a sword shall pierce. Thy own soul a sword shall pierce. Why is Mary called our sorrowful mother, or Mata Dolorosa? What was her sorrow? The Gospels tell, tell us about Jesus' passion. She sweat, he sweated blood because of his anguish. He was scourged, crowned with thorns, crucified shamefully on the cross. But to what extent did she, Our Lady, suffer? How great was her sorrow? To answer these questions, I want to invite you to meditate with me two words. Two words. One, motherhood. Second, sorrow. Number one, motherhood. If you are a mother, you know that bringing forth a child is more than just like dropping off eight pounds of flesh. You carry him or her in your womb for nine months, and now you behold your child in your arm. You know what it is like to breastfeed, to nurture your child, to see them grow up day after day. Moreover, motherhood effects in you a psychological change. You take on a new life, a new beginning. It is like a new garment, if you will. And the pattern of your child's life is now weaved into this new garment, here laden with gold of laughter, and there with a violet flower of tears. Your life is not your own. Your life is no longer your own. Moreover, you sense and notice things about your child that nobody else would. I know this from my mother. My father can be oblivious to my thoughts and emotions, but not my mom. I can hide nothing from my mom. She knows my sorrows, sometimes better than I did. She knows why I'm nervous, angry, happy, and most importantly, as your mothers know, hungry. <laughs> this new relationship makes you cherish the life of your child more than anything else in the world, anything else in the world. It is dearer to you than even your own. This is why a mother would sacrifice even her own life for the life of the child. I'm firmly convinced that my mother will do the same. Mary, as a mother, uniquely experiences this intimate bond with Christ. When he was sad, she too underwent sadness. When he suffered, she suffered. His life is dearer to her than even her own. Word number two, sorrow. What does sorrow mean? What is it? What causes sorrows in us? 
while we experience sorrow or sadness, perhaps when we experience the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, the loss of a bad grade, a lost game. After all, it is caused by some kind of loss, a kind of suffering, an evil, a privation of some good. It is this anguish of heart. But I want to say, most fundamentally, most fundamentally, it is caused by love. What do I mean? Now, to give you a very silly example, when I was about maybe five or five or four, I was extremely spoiled, very very spoiled. I'm an only child,、um, so I got everything I wanted basically, and I'm very lucky that I'm here.、Um, so one day, one day. You parents know this.、Uh, we walk into a mall, and then there's、uh, this brand new toy in one of the shops, and I want it. I want it bad. I love that toy. <laughs> nope, my parents wouldn't get it to me. And guess what I did? I went on the ground and I started rolling, <laughs> and roll and roll and roll, and it didn't work. So then there's the tears. Now I can get the things I wanted. The things I love, and I start crying and weeping. I still won't get it. But you see, you see, it's a silly example. It's a very superficial love. But you see, my sorrow of tears. I was so grief stricken, right? It's because my love for that little toy that I wanted. Now I was so traumatized that I, that, that I blocked out this memory. So my parents were telling me about this years after to say how spoiled. That was. But notice, sorrow is caused by love. A superficial love for me, but for her, for Mary, it's a profound love. So it's a profound sorrow that she experiences. The more you are capable of loving, the more you open up yourselves for suffering. The more you are capable of loving, the more you open up yourselves for suffering. Those who love will inevitably suffer. If you shun suffering, you will shun also love. And the, the more you love, the more you will be grieved by the absence of the beloved. You will be grieved by the evil your beloved suffers. Mothers and fathers, because you love your children, you know when you know what it is to grieve for them, to fear for them. When they suffered, you are sorrowful when they hurt themselves, when they cry, when they are in pain, and as many of you perhaps experience, when they have fallen away from their faith. You cannot bear to see your son or daughter being in pain and happy. When you see them suffer, it is as if part of you died with them. Now consider our mother, our blessed mother. In the same way, Mary's sorrow is caused by love. Her grief is proportionate to her love for her dear son. It is caused by love, a love that flows out from this divinely appointed relationship she has with Jesus, her son. She loves him more than anyone else because of her motherhood. Which no one else in the world shares by nature. Therefore, no one in the world suffers more than Mary, when she saw the love of her life tortured to death, nailed to the cross, crucified with criminals. In a supernatural level, she loves Jesus as God because of her gift of faith. She knows better than anyone else that Jesus is God. And therefore, no one in the world suffers more grief than Mary, when she saw the Creator of heaven and earth was dishonored by His ungrateful creatures. She grieved for us sinners who murdered God. So, how much did she suffer? How great was her suffering? The answer is that it is a sorrow beyond all our imagination. Beyond everything that we have ever experienced, have you been heartstricken before? Think of a moment. Think of a time when you are sad, when you are in sorrow. 
feel it. Now multiply that thousands, tens of thousands, thousands of thousands, and more. Now let us see what was her reaction. In the face of her sorrow, Mary did not flinch. Instead, she went forth to meet the sword for our sake, for the sake of our redemption. By her womb, pierced by the sword, we are saved, and that is why we honor her as our sorrowful mother. We owe her our gratitude because she offered up her very life, her child, the fruit of her womb, her son, and our God Jesus Christ, for our redemption. By her offering, we are born to eternal life. She is our mother. Now, how do we honor her? How shall we honor her? We honor her most by imitating her virtues, by loving her son. And I suggest, especially the virtue of courage, to meet the sword. Now, not all of you are mothers or fathers, but our Lord has entrusted not only to you, mothers and fathers, but to all of us, young or old, men and women. And even your children, someone to love, someone to bring to God, your friend, your family member, someone who has not encountered Christ. If you call yourselves, if we call ourselves Christians, the disciples of Jesus Christ, if we truly love God, we will not bear to see our beloved suffer the eternal pain of being separated from God. It is our sacred duty. To grieve for them, to weep for them, with tears to offer them up in our prayers. If we love as Mary does, our soul shall be pierced. So I invite all of you. Indeed, I beg all of you. When you go home today, this Sunday, find a quiet place, five minutes, ten minutes, a time with our Lord. Imagine someone. Think of someone whom you love, a beloved, your friend, a family member, someone you encountered. Offer them to God. Pray for them, and ask God, "What can you do to bring them to the cross of Jesus Christ, to encounter the love of Jesus Christ?" If we love as Mary loves, our soul shall be pierced. So the words of Simeon is also spoken to us: "Thy soul a sword shall pierce; thy soul a sword shall pierce." May our sorrowful mother intercede for us and give us the courage to meet the sword. Amen. Please keep,、uh, please keep, Brother Xavier Marie, in your prayers, especially this academic year, as he's、um, with us for this academic year. And pray for all of our student brothers going through formation. If you'd like to say hello, we'll be over at this entrance. Take home a bulletin for all the things that are going on this week. Children's faith formation registration is open for children who did, are still to receive their sacraments. Register online on our parish website or at the parish office. Classes beginning this October 1st at 9 a.m. in the school. Father Francis will be starting another series of meetings for those who have lost a loved one recently. It's called Seasons of Hope. You may have seen the posters, but Seasons of Hope, and there's more information in the bulletin.、Um, as you know from the banner on Colorado and just going around on campus, you know that the carnival starts on Friday night. So,、uh, so pre-sale ride and food tickets are available in the parish office. As you may know, the lower parking lot and、uh, is currently preoccupied with.、Uh, With the booths, and there's, you know, there's just, it's just, it looks like the carnival's coming. So we,、uh, we apologize for any inconvenience.、Um, the, and the lower parking lot will be unavailable until the 26th.、Um, it's not too late for sign-ups for our new parish pictorial directory. 
It's a hope that all the families will be involved in the, in the pictorial directory. They haven't done this in 25 years, remember, so it's great to uh, be part of this endeavor for the centennial. Here's an important point. Walk-ins will not be admitted, um, so you need to register online and through the parish office. So for all participants, we'll receive a free 8 by 10 and a directory. So visit the website or the parish office to, uh, to register for a slot for the directory. Again, no walk-ins. And finally, as you remember from last year, we had a student art contest, so we're doing this again. So the student art contest is here for a second year, and all school-aged children from K through eighth grade are invited to participate. Submission forms and contest rules are available in the parish office. Please rise now for the final blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you always in the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to God.